Hello, hello, and welcome to Art Pop Talk. I'm Bianca. And I'm Gianna. Gianna, my question for you this week is which Lil Nas X look is your favorite? Ooh, I think the red cowboy getup from the 2019 VMAs. It had these jeweled embellishments on it that you know I just live for. You know what? I totally agree. How could I not go with another cowboy outfit? Mine is definitely the pink Versace worn at the 2020 Grammys. I mean, that is the kind of energy that I consistently need in my life. (laughs) In today's Art Pop Talk, we are talking about Lil Nas X's new video for Montero, Call Me By Your Name, and all of the art historical visuals we are noticing within it. That's right. We're going to look at some of the characters and periods referenced in the Montero video and think about their place within art history. We'll also dive into a discussion about the human blood shoes that were released in tandem with the video. Gianna, are you ready to slide down a stripper pole into the hell of APT? Always. Well, well, well. Howdy do, Bianca. Howdy do. (laughs) You know, I got the vaccine uh, Your first last shot. week, Yay. my first shot, so that's pretty good, but, you know, we're back here on FaceTime. We are. You, you're you where you're meant to be right there on my screen, not looking at me <laughs> directly <laughs> anymore. I honestly, that was funny. I don't know how we ever recorded like that. It's too close. I know. It feels very strange. But. Yeah. Now I feel I feel comfortable because I have my whole station, like my recording station from home is just spread out like it normally is, you know? Yes, no, exactly. <laughs> well, we have a super exciting episode to get into today. So I think we should just jump right into it. Is that okay, Gianna? Of course. Or do you do you have any more updates for us? Mm, yeah, no. No live updates for you guys today. I get well, I guess I get I get my second COVID shot on Friday, so that's exciting. Oh, nice. So your girl that will is be exciting. fully vaccinated here soon. That's my only update for you guys. I love it. Thank you. Okay, so this pre-art news <laughs> update <laughs> we have for you guys is referencing a art news story that we did a few weeks ago on the Dispo app. A few episodes back, we talked about the new app that acts like a disposable camera, and the app was founded by David Dobrik. And since we talked about the app, a lot of things have come out about David and the Vlog Squad. And Gianna, I don't know about you, but when we talked about it, I'd heard about the Vlog Squad just casually. And I guess, I mean, I knew who they were and that David was kind of a media star, but I really had never seen or watched any of the videos before any of the vlog squad videos and no yeah he's never a person i've i've ever like kept up with right so i'm not going to recap the situation but i think the comments by celebs podcast did a great and thoughtful recap and if you're interested i'll link that in our show notes for you i just wanted to let you know that since we had talked about it just a few weeks ago david is stepping back from the dispo app to quote not distract from the company's growth and all those kind of investment companies that you know we had talked about in the story, um, the venture capital firm Spark Capital, which led the app's twenty million dollar financing round in February, announced on Twitter that it would quote sever all ties with Dispo, writing that we have stepped down from our position on the board and we are in the process of making arrangements to ensure we do not profit from our recent investment with Dispo. So I've deleted the app and we shall see if something else like this pops up in place of Dispo, but I just wanted to give that update since it was pretty recent that we had um, talked about it. So moving on, Gianna, what other art news do we have for the day? For today's art news, we're talking about some exciting news coming out of the Louvre. The museum's president director, Jean-Luc Martinez, said last week that, quote, for the first time, anyone can access the entire collection of works from a computer or smartphone for free. Whether they are on display in the museum, on loan, or even long term, or in storage, end quote. We actually don't have a 100% answer as to how many objects reside in the museum's collection. Um, 
<laughs> Bianca's raising her eyebrows like, ooh, conspiracy theory, maybe. <laughs> the Louvre's official release estimate was about 482,000 works have been digitized in its collections database, representing about three quarters of the entire archive. The museum also recently revamped its homepage so that it's designed for more casual visitors, more cell phone compatibility, and has translations in Spanish, English, and Chinese. Andrew McClellan, a Tufts University professor and author of Inventing the Louvre, Art, Politics, and the Origins of the Modern Museum, says that the strategy of putting nearly everything online is keeping with the Enlightenment ideals that shaped the museum after the French Revolution uh, is overwhelming. Quote, collecting the world's knowledge together under one roof and then making it available for researchers and the general public. And an NPR article made a really interesting point about reparations and stolen works that don't necessarily belong to the Louvre. The article mm. reads, quote, it's also unclear how many of the online images may be of sacred objects from countries other than France and not meant to be casually viewed. The digital catalog includes items that may have been plundered by Nazi or colonial forces. In a separate album titled MNR Works, which stands for National Museum Recovery. And Seuss Anderson, a professor of museum studies at George Washington University, who studies the impact of digital technology on museums says, quote, this has to be coming up against these questions around restitution and repatriation and thinking about what the digitization of cultural heritage means within a context that is contested. Bianca, what do you think about this? I think it was only a matter of time until the Louvre made this choice. I think they're obviously an entirely massive institution and this is actually a similar thing that's part of my job, kind of revamping our website and thinking about how our digital collection is accessible within that. And I mean, it really is, it's a huge undertaking. Um, I mean, let's say close to half a million objects and, you know, thinking about the placement and the scale of so many of those objects in that collection and what it looks like to get those high quality images that corresponds to your site and, you know, how that functions on a technological level. I mean, for someone who actually does this, I can't imagine how labor intensive and meticulous this project was. I mean, they're the Louvre, they have to be perfection. And there's the technical side, and then there's also the research side where on their site, they're giving you a pretty good amount of information on the piece. So while this may have been kind of inevitable, I think, as far as the progression of our technology and how, how that goes in museums. I think that, you know, this feeds into the visual so much. And then of course, COVID on top of that, this plays into something that came up in our episode on comics, but thinking about the democratization of the art world and for the Louvre to give more access to people, I think just does set a huge precedent for other institutions to follow. Not everyone is ever going to get to see the museum in person. And of course, there are now other issues of access with tech but and Wi-Fi and devices. But I think even though this might seem pretty normal for us, we kind of expect museums to have digital collections and digital, digital access available. Of course, you know, we should be able to get these things, but this really is pretty major news, I think. Yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you and I have both dappled in archiving of works mm -hmm. and it's definitely no joke from you know larger institutions to small collections and we've seen how easily that can go wrong yeah <laughs> and the documentation of artworks is just so so important in keeping a record of that and i think it is really interesting in the context of the transparency and what is in their collection and do yeah. they need to be having these objects um, yeah, so right. I think it is pretty And also news. putting in the work to figure out where those objects originally came from. And like you said, looking into the documentation and yeah. um, also looking into records and the provenance and where it came from and who bought it and, and things like that, I think is also, a, I would imagine, is a pretty heavy part of that project as well. As far as the layout of the archive goes on the you know user side of it, I really do hope that is it that it is extremely user-friendly because time and time again 
digital archives are a thing, but they're not always super accessible because the websites are so, so difficult to access and they're not, it, it's not well laid out and it's very outdated. So if they are going to do this, I'll be really interested to see just how it functions as a user as well. Yeah, I was playing around on the site and I think it was pretty easy for me to navigate, but I'm also one who is like entrenched in museum site building. That's mm -hmm. part of my job. So I thought it was great. I mean, from my perspective, but I'm also kind of used to knowing where to look mm -hmm. as far as that things go. But the images, I mean, I was really zooming in on the images and that is pretty fantastic from like a student's perspective too, just being able to really get close to those details you might be looking for when you're doing research is awesome. Mm -hmm. I really want an archive system where you can look up a work of art by context clues. Like you're yeah. not exactly sure like what you're looking for, like who the artist is, but you mm -hmm. have these context clues of time periods, yes. characters. Like I, I would absolutely Figures. love to see that. Figures. Plant life. You know. Yes. Symbols. Like uh, yes. I think that would be amazing i think we should do that gianna i have some we'll talk after <laughs> we may oh need our apt tech wizards to come and join us for a project i have a really fantastic idea for a museum project and mm -hmm. if anyone here listening is in tech literally email us right away because well, I, I think we can make bank off this idea what i'm well, you know, then let's not give it away. But, <laughs> um, you know, I think about like Pinterest, how you can highlight an image and then it'll, other images will pop up that look yes, like, like reverse it. image search. Yes. And I would just love to do that with like, you know, contextual words in relation to art history. That would be, that just makes too much sense, you know? Oh yeah. It would be too easy though. If art historians and museum staff <laughs> were working on that. God forbid the people have knowledge to the arts. Speaking of God, do we uh -oh. want to transition? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's do it. All righty, friends. For today's art pop talk, We are thinking about the new music video by Lil Nas X for his new single, Montero, Call Me By Your Name. We're going to start by kind of breaking down the music video and sharing all of the art historical references that we thought of while we were watching it. And then a little bit later on, we're just gonna dive in a little bit into the 666 shoes that are also causing some predicaments. Lil Nas X, I just want to say, if you're listening, you know, you say things out loud and then somehow the universe kind of hears you and they come back to you. So Lil Nas, oh my gosh, if you're listening, we stand. Please come on the podcast and talk with us some more about the video and all of the images that inspired you. Because if we could talk art history with Lil Nas X, I mean, that would be amazing. And I'm just going to put it out there because I really, honestly, I think we have a shot. I'm just gonna I'm just gonna sit on that. I'm just gonna manifest that energy and yeah. Truly manifest that Versace pink cowboy energy. Yeah. And I'm sending my audio waves. If little Nas came on the podcast, I could die and go to hell a happy woman. <laughs> I could ride down that same stripper pole right into hell and mm -hmm. be just fine. <laughs> So by now, I'm sure many of you have heard the song, watched the video, seen all the TikToks. The TikToks are fabulous. <laughs> and there really is, there's a ton happening in this video, so much of which we're not even going to have time to get into today. But in an interview with Time Magazine, Lil Nas X said he wanted to deploy this type of iconography and symbolism to draw a connection between ancient and modern day persecution. Quote, I wanted to use these things that have been around for so long to tell my own story and the story of so many other people in the community or people who have been outcast in general through history. It's the same thing over and over. So Gianna, let us kick things off with you. Let's have you talk about the opening of the video and the Adam and Eve situation that's being referenced. 
Yes, for sure. So before we get into this fantasy garden, though, I want to start with the narrative that Lil Nas X provides for us as we enter Montero. He says, quote, in life, we hide the parts of ourselves we don't want the world to see. We lock them away. We tell them no, we banish them. But here, we don't. Welcome to Montero. The video is sweeping across this landscape that is composed of fragmented body parts that appear like ruins or ancient statues. And we see these hints of Lil Nas X's body parts in these architectural elements. So Montero is Lil Nas X's real name. So going right into it, we know we are being welcomed into his psyche or his reality. We are going to be talking about a lot of different lived experiences and different forms of trauma in this performance. And I don't want to go too much into this, but I feel as though discussions we have had about experiencing um, and entering constructed worlds for entertainment and expression and a purpose can be helpful when learning about this particular performance. With that in mind, if you have listened to our Chromatica episode, you can think of some of the artistic concepts at play that we discuss there. I just want to say I am so here for a Gaga Lil Nas X Chromatica Montero collab. Can I just put also manifest that out into the universe because can we also just also put out into the universe in words because I know that we're all thinking it like Chromatica has really set this trend and this pattern in music in creating these own fictitious worlds and kind of fantasies and post-humanism. I think it's a yeah. lot of like what Doja Cat is doing. Obviously, we see it here with Montero. I think I think Taylor Swift is kind of like really doing her own thing and also pushing the bounds, but I think with her kind of realm as well, it's just been yeah. really interesting to see that this has become a very popular trend currently. Yeah, it is interesting to see how everyone's personal lived experiences is transformed into a real visual world. And I know that everyone already has that. Like every single person's lived experience is replicated in their type of own realm, whatever that may be. But it's really interesting to see how these artists are pushing that for their audiences in particular. Mm -hmm. So getting back to it, after we know that we have entered Montero, we are taken to a symbolic setting that is very reminiscent of the Garden of Eden. And this setting in particular has a very uh, kind of terrestrial paradise feeling to it, but also feels very temperamental to me because of these fragmented statues we were first introduced to. And there is this also instantaneous foreshadowing of events happening as soon as we see the snake that leads us to the tree. Many of our listeners are going to recognize or be familiar with the imagery at play in this scene in particular, uh, you know, whether through personal or art historical understanding. And if you are a listener who is new to art history and don't fully understand all this loaded symbolism in Christian iconography, that is also totally okay. And I'm just going to briefly take us through what I know of the story of creation and what I thought was important about this opener. In the book of Genesis, a serpent coerces Eve to eat the fruit from the tree of knowledge in the Garden of Eden, in which she and Adam were forbidden from by God. She eats the fruit and then gets Adam in on that sweet museum juice, <laughs> and they aren't as innocent and unaware of their surroundings anymore, and especially they are more conscious of their bodies and the idea of their own nakedness. Now that they have more knowledge, although that's great, they are now susceptible to other forms of corruption or evil, basically other ways of sinning. In Call Me By Your Name, there is no fruit, but the serpent is a prevalent part of this narrative and exists as their own character. And I thought this was really interesting because when you see this, this scene throughout art history, the serpent can be sometimes just a strategically placed symbol and feels more like a side character because depending on what the artist is trying to say, you know, it could really be focusing on the fact that the woman should be the one who's kind of blamed for eating the fruit and for the downfall of, you know, man and getting her museum juice on. 
or it can be presented as a human slash serpent hybrid and is really integral to the narrative. And let me tell you that these images of serpents are fascinating and sometimes freaking hilarious. Taking The Fall of Man and the Lamentation by Hugo van der Goes. So I actually found an excellent visual analysis on this painting by a writer, Miriam N. Zoven. Quote, Flemish painter Hugo van der Goes depicts the serpent as a two-legged salamander with blue fur, duck feet, and an otter-like tail, a human head with braided pigtails, and the coiling demeanor of a multi-level marketer trying to sell you on her range of apple-scented essential oils. <laughs> Eve is totally buying what that snake is selling, and Adam, in the back of his mind, knows the snake is running a pyramid scheme, but is going along with it and hoping God doesn't notice. Spoiler alert, he notices. <laughs> End quote. Truly, Eve in this image we're looking at, Eve is so appealed. It's like it's like the beginning of the pyramid scheme. We are like, oh, my friend is doing this. I haven't really talked to them in a while, but like this lipstick might look cool. Like her right, face no, like is so inquisitive to what this little demon <laughs> animal is trying to buy, or like what it, it's trying to sell her. Also, with, with just, like, the barrier of the tree in between them, it makes me feel, you know, like, the snake is just, like, hiding behind Facebook, and they were, like, old, like, high school friends, and, like, the yes. serpent is just, like, DMing them on Facebook, like, trying to get them to, like, buy Arbon. This um, is the most amazing art pop talk analogy I think I've ever heard. Yeah, truly. It's accurate. So I thought that was definitely worth sharing. Thank you, Miriam. Um, but in this scene, I felt altogether there is this merging of symbols and a hybridity of characters taking place um, in the video. The serpent is used as a metaphor for supposed corruption, meaning they are taking on the role of the forbidden fruit at the same time. At first, Lil Nas X is hesitant and is scared. He tries to run away, but once he takes a bite or kisses the serpent, he becomes aware of his sexuality, just as Adam and Eve became aware of what it meant to have a body and the complexities with that. I feel as though the lyrics here were also a, you know, good hybrid moment between Lil Nas X's character and the storyline between Adam and Eve, because his actions represent that of both, but at the same time we get the lyric, quote, if Eve ain't in the garden, you know that you can call me by your name, meaning she's not around and others in general are not around so we can do what we want right now in this moment. And at this point, this lyric and moment introduces us to concepts dealing with closeting and oppressive feelings and lived experiences that Lil Nas X and people that he has been in relationships with have gone through. And we are taken out of that paradise and it transitions us to the scene of, of persecution. To use a historical reference of Adam and Eve as they undergo this transition out of paradise, using Christian terminology, this is called the expulsion. A good visual example of this transition is Michelangelo's depiction of Adam and Eve found in the central ceiling vault of the Sistine Chapel um, in the Vatican. The hybrid serpent human form uh, splits this narrative in two as it coils around the tree of knowledge. And reading from left to right, we see the serpent handing the fruit to Eve, and the two are feasting from the fruits of the tree. And then on the other side, Adam and Eve are recoiling in their bodies and have very shameful expressions on their face, and they are being banished from Eden by uh, an angel or a divine figure. That was so good, Gianna. Thank you so much. I just, I'm so welcome. I'm never going to be able to get over that analogy that you presented. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you, Miriam. <laughs> I also just wanted to note that there's a great Time article. Um, and I know that Lil Nas did a, uh, an interview with them, but we'll link it in our references. Um, that And they gave other really cool examples of art and give a nice historical breakdown as well. So I just wanted to say that there's another article we'll link with more images if you're interested. Um, but right now, 
we we have this you know adam eve serpent scene and then the camera pans to the tree of knowledge which is inscribed with a greek phrase that translates to quote after the division of the two parts of man each desiring his other half this phrase is taken from Plato's Symposium and specifically from a passage delivered by Plato's rendering of the playwright Aristophanes. This is a recount of an origin story of mankind in which humans were originally two bodies stuck together, some man and man, some women and women, and some men and women. When the bodies were separated by an angry Zeus, each one longed for their other half, which quote unquote explains why we feel love and desire for different types of bodies. A professor of classics at Columbia says, quote, the passage speaks to a capacity to imagine an equal level of neutrality to all of what we think of as sexual orientations. It's an early example of homosexuality and bisexuality represented as being familiar or acceptable in ways they are not always seen in our society, end quote. And we need to move on, but definitely check out that Time article in our resources because they quote Vanessa Stovall, a scholar of classical studies and ancient mythology, who says that this passage of symposium has long been a source of fascination and inspiration in queer spaces and in queer theory. And they go into more detail about this passage specifically and how it's also been used as the subject of historical discussions in pop culture, um, including a Broadway play. So moving on to the middle section of the video, as the song's second verse begins, the video moves to this arena type architectural space where Lil Nas appears shackled in this honestly stunning Marie Antoinette <laughs> pink wig. <laughs> and we have these other figures of authority who kind of take on this elite role and they assume to carry the fate of Lil Nas in his imprisoned state. There's an angry, aggressive crowd that mimics an audience of something like a sports arena or think of a Colosseum-esque space if we're going to go with that Lil Nas's reference of Greco-Roman lineage. This audience is seemingly also made of stone, which in an article suggests that, quote, perhaps indicates the mob turning against him, which lacks independent thought. From here, it is assumed that a judgment is made by these elites and Lil Nas is stoned to death by said stoned audience. When Lil Nas starts to ascend into heaven, he is not greeted by Saint Peter, but an angelic figure who may resemble the Greek mythological figure Ganymede. Ganymede was a boy whose beauty was so intense that Zeus turned into an eagle and carried him to Olympus to be the cupbearer for the gods. He has long been a sort of symbol of homosexuality, including in Shakespeare's As You Like It. Roland Betancourt, a professor at the University of California, Irvine, and the author of Byzantine Intersectionality, Sexuality, Gender, and Race in the Middle Ages, says, quote, In this moment of Christian ascent, you have this very queer iconography as an early example of representation of same gender desire in antiquity. I see that scene of salvation as not that he's going to heaven, but rather having a same gender consummation that is legitimized by the pagan gods. So Ganymede is a major symbol of homosexual love in the visual and literary arts, and there are many different interpretations of this story as kind of goes the norm with mythological and visual representations of that. So Gianna and I are now looking at one from Rubens, which we posted on our Instagram. And I think that today our queer art historical studies can kind of uncover these different interpretations and how these images were both perceived in their historical time and, and how we view these characters and artworks today. Some scholars note that the image of Ganymede was that of this kind of naive adolescent who was accompanied by the eagle, and the homoerotic aspects of the legend were rarely dealt with, so some say. A couple sources said that the story was often, quote, heterosexualized, moreover, and the Neoplatonic interpretation of the myth that may have been common in the Italian Renaissance, in which the rape of Ganymede represented the ascent to spiritual perfection, 
seem to be of lesser interest to the Enlightenment philosophers. So again, I just want to point out that there's a lot of queer art history to be taken into account, and especially with this character in particular, but um, there's a lot to kind of uncover and unpack within this character in itself. So um, I think for now, Gianna is ready to talk about the next part of the video. Yeah. um, Well, thank you for that analysis, Bianca, because I just think that whole that whole part of the music video was one of the most intriguing to me. And I actually had some more thoughts about that part. Um, just because I think that is probably the most like ambiguous part of the video. When he's first... And it goes by very quickly. Yes. Like when you watch the whole video, I was kind of replaying it over and over again. Because mm-hmm. it's even kind of hard to see that he's actually being stoned to death. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was watching it over and over and it, it just goes, it moves so fast, but there's so much there. And there's a lot of different kind of time periods that seem to be present in a single space. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he's dipped in this kind of like unicorn blood like substance, which is the only yeah. way I can describe it after the stoning. And, and at this point, like being dipped in the substance kind of shows, okay, you know, okay, so now at this point he's being represented visually in a different way. We know that this scene is one of transition from Mm -hmm. earthly to another realm. And this just got me thinking, okay, maybe, I don't know, he is being represented in like a pure manner of at this point or being like pure of his sins Mm -hmm. um, as he's awaiting this like winged figure at the height of his journey um, to be accepted into this new realm. and I think this figure is really important, as you just discussed, but it's the only figure that I think is the most ambiguous to us. Every person or character is represented as Lil Nas X, with a little bit of an exception when it comes to the devil, but we will get into that. My point being, though, why are we not allowed to see the winged figure in full? Yeah, I completely agree. That's a really interesting point. When I was reading all these articles, they were kind of making this loose allegory to Ganymede. And I don't know if Lil Nas has kind of talked about who the inspiration for that character is. And I also think it's interesting just in this mode of transition, it feels like Lil Nas makes the choice himself because he kind of grabs onto the pole. Well, right, exactly. And I, I so. feel like I have so many questions about that decision to kind of like grab onto it and embrace the next stage of what's coming. Well, that's going to bring me to my next point. And my personal thoughts in this moment are, you know, everything is up for interpretation, but that Lil Nas X isn't using his own person entirely to represent Christian ideals or heaven in this form of this winged figure Um, because maybe it's something that has just been so destructive towards him and perhaps therefore it doesn't feel right to use his person to embody that spirit. Mm -hmm. However, I think the part of this narrative that is visually unclear is does he get sent to hell or does he go on his own free will? Mm Mm-hmm keeping up with Lil Nas X's commentary on his work, such as his tweet, quote, y'all love saying we go into hell, but get upset when I actually go there, LMAO, end quote. (laughs) So pairing this with loaded history can lead us to think that, sure, we know this was a conscious act on behalf of the artist, but the character in Montero is choosing to go to hell through his own free will. I mean, there's so much to unpack there and just thinking about. It's like, it's the hypocrisy of our history, but it's also synonymous in the story of Lucifer, which I find fascinating. Yeah. So this is where I would like to start talking about the devil before he became the devil, as we know. The reason why Lucifer, the angel, fell from heaven was literally because Lucifer was kind of obsessed with himself. (laughs) He was smart, he was beautiful, and he was prideful. Mm. He didn't want to worship God anymore. He wanted to be worshipped. 
for my art reference in relation to the devil, I wanted to talk about the devilishly handsome neo-Gothic statue of Lucifer created in 1848 by the Belgian artist Gilliam Gies, who was known for exploring sexuality and mythology through his artwork. I just need to say this is a, this fine. Is a fine looking little devil. <laughs> I mean, mm-hmm. Yeah, and they literally had to remove it from church because it was so hot <laughs> and like people were getting distracted. <laughs> um, so this is definitely a thread that we are following here today. Um, this piece also has a, you know, unique history being created as a replacement for his brother's Joseph statue of, of Lucifer um, for the Liege Cathedral uh, in Belgium. Um, essentially, they needed a new statue because the first one that Joseph created was too <laughs> sensual. And then Gilliam Gives end up creating an even more pensive and more hotter one. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> I love that. Um, I love it so much. So, similarly to the original commission, this one is two is naked except for the cloth worn about his waist and his bat like wings that take form in the shape of a vesica pisces which is a very loaded uh, shape um, often served as the kind of divine backdrop for figure like jesus and sometimes it i was just gonna say sorry to interrupt it almost looks like a three-dimensional kind of mandorla like the, the or almond shape Exactly, exactly. I mean, that all definitely plays into it. Um, specifically, like a lot of times when I'm just representing like vulvas, this is definitely mm -hmm. something that I have to think about the shape. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you know, it, it goes in hand in hand with figures like Jesus or in, or in Greek and Roman mythology. Um, it's associated with goddesses like Venus and Aphrodite. It was understood as a token of fecundity and renewing of life. Other indicators in this sculpture, such as the broken scepter, his crown in his hand, and chained ankle indicate his loss of power in this moment. Mm -hmm. The last important symbol is the apple at his feet, or the forbidden fruit, referencing the original sin in the Garden of Eden. So circling back, pride was also part of the sin, you know, that got Adam and Eve in trouble. Pride also is very loaded in a contemporary sense and mm -hmm. used as a slogan and a term of empowerment within queer spaces, peoples, and moments. Lil Nas X in this video isn't just choosing to go to hell. He is choosing to belong to spaces where he can feel pride and claim mm. ownership of his sexuality. So of course he's going to make an entrance. He's going to do that shit in style. He's going to pride, baby. I'll see you there. But I do use this sculpture because one, it is just freaking gorgeous. It's stunning. It's and stunning. And I just wanted to acknowledge that pushing and manipulating religious iconography at the hands of curious, um, you know, artists is something that has happened for hundreds and hundreds of years. And it's worth adding to this conversation. And, you know, there are viewers who weren't just jarred by what they were seeing now, but just as they were jarred by seeing the sculpture of Geefs, um, you know, way back when in... yeah the you know mid 1800s so i just found that really interesting yeah that's so fascinating i i love what you said about pride gian i think that's such an interesting way to kind of think about our spaces mm -hmm. um and i just need to say i'm ready for june i'm ready and to, to ride honest, a straight into pride i mean you should have seen my little like thinking cap on because this was the first time that i had really thought about that word pride and how it's a sin. Interesting that is as a sin and that like cleaning that ownership yes. from queer people. I was just like, man, like I just love that even more. And it's really something that I had never thought of before. Yes. I mean, just like, oh my gosh, I just have a million questions for him. I mean, thinking about you and I did not necessarily grow up in kind of a consistent religious space. And I think coming into art history without those personal experiences um we kind of disassociate 
these Mm -hmm. different connections sometimes and then seeing an artist like this put all of these amazing pieces together to talk about his lived experience and the experiences of others who have been oppressed is it's really stunning Mm -hmm. yeah yeah Yeah. um i just wanted to say i think whenever you said his brother made an even hotter one i feel like the art history babes said something so similar in one of their episodes so i'm gonna link that episode in the show notes but i think the art history babes have an episode on the devil and it may be one of my favorite episodes ever of theirs it's really great so uh highly recommend i'll I'll link it for you guys Mm -hmm. all right we are going to take a little break and when we come back we'll be looking at lil nas x's shoes So Gianna, now that we've talked a little more about the video and gone into some details, do you want to kind of share any other overall thoughts that you have before we kind of get into the shoes and wrap things up? Hmm, Goodness. Um, Yeah, I mean, the song is a bop. (laughs) Oh, it's so good. Yeah, can we talk about the song itself? It's just... it's. (laughs) <laughs> like i'm just like walking around the house like feeling like a bad bitch um no it, it's so good it's definitely a bop i'm very much here for it um i just obviously i'm a sucker for when these kinds of theories and topics merge within contemporary and pop spaces um I mean, this isn't necessarily a new thought, um, but I think this is going to be a moment that we keep going back to. I think what Lil Nas is doing uh, in the scope of pop and and rap music is just yeah. going to make a huge impact in moving forward. And yeah. I think he's definitely worth talking about. And um, I just think this music video in particular is just going to be one that we keep going back to. Um, I... I find it personally just very like empowering. Um, you mm-hmm. know, when we get into our discussions about the shoes, I'll you know talk about those other kind of contradicting perspectives in a little bit. And um, I don't want to you know jump into it too much, but mm-hmm. I think there actually is a lot of optimism that is taking place in this video, and that is actually something that I I don't is I don't think is being talked about because mm-hmm. of the visuals. And um, but that's something that I actually really really appreciate about this music video um but i don't i almost don't even know you know what more like i can say about it because i think it's a very iconic moment and is going to continue to be a very iconic moment yeah yeah i love it and and just like you said i think this is a huge moment to recognize and appreciate who lil nas x is and thinking about his identity. He is a gay black man talking about his own experience and telling his story. And he should. He absolutely should. So, and I I'm think sure again, also- like providing a place for us to have difficult conversations, which you know that we're here for. Yeah. I mean, I guess we haven't gone into it too much. And, and I don't know that it's necessarily our place to talk on this further because it's Mm -hmm. not our experience on kind of his side or this conservative kind of christian uproar whatever Mm -hmm. but yeah i mean i I think i i hope that it exposes what he's and i i just want to read this tweet from him in case you haven't seen it that said quote I spent my entire teenage years hating myself because of the shit y'all preached, what happened to me, because I was gay. So I hope you are mad. Stay mad. Feel the same anger you teach us to have towards ourselves. So I think he's absolutely entitled to that. And I hope that these conversations, you know, we always talk about this, but, you know, like the ones that you and I are having kind of translate into different spaces and Mm -hmm. make the world a better place. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Okay, before we let you go, we are going to talk about these shoes. I really wish I could get a pair. <laughs> and once again, we've got a very interesting parallel, I think, to these kinds of commercialized conversations and the art news st stories that we've been having on the podcast. So basically, Lil Nas X collaborated with a Brooklyn-based company to design 666 shoes that supposedly feature a drop of human blood in them provided by some of the company's employees who made the shoes. The shoes were selling for $1,018, which is a reference to the Luke 1018 verse seen on the shoes, which leads you to the biblical text that reads, quote, he replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So Nike has sued, I, th I think it's pronounced mischief, M-S-C-H-F, the Brooklyn-based brand because they used a Nike shoe and then sold it without Nike authorization. And the brand noted that Nike was not involved in the process in any capacity. And in a statement on Sunday, Nike said, quote, we do not have a relationship with Lil Nas X or Mischief. Nike did not design or release these shoes and we do not endorse them. So since then, Lil Nas tweeted, quote, I haven't been upset until today. I feel like it's fucked up that they have so much power and they can get shoes canceled. Freedom of expression gone out the window, but that's going to change soon. Lil Nas also put out an apology video <laughs> about his shoes, which is so funny, where he kind of gets on and he looks like he's going to like talk about, uh, you know, standard apology video, whatever. But then it just cuts straight to the video and... Honestly, I think that's the best apology video we've gotten from a celebrity. <laughs> People have a lot of opinions about this. Whatever. You know, if you're being hateful, I can't endorse that. I don't see why. But if you want to look at Twitter arguments, you know, go for it. Gianna and I are not the type of people to kind of engage in any of that or share it when it's not useful or productive. So and thinking about this in a different way. Gianna, my question for you is, as an artist, does this set a precedent for creativity in marketing? And what does this mean in terms of kind of brand appropriation and creative license for artists? Yeah, really interesting question. As you just said, what we are looking at here is merchandise and trademark infringement or appropriated artwork or object. Mm -hmm. Because I understand where he is coming from as you know, an artist or from an artist perspective, I do see this as a limited edition commercial object that is significant to pop culture and therefore has artful significance and in the future historic significance. Mm -hmm. However, I will say that perhaps I don't understand or I am maybe ignorant to why they chose to appropriate this commercial item. Like why not just use a totally new shoe design yeah my thoughts on this more go back to like pop and trendy iconography and the fact that it is common for streetwear companies to commonly you know push the boundaries of fashion and play off of bigger commercial fashion trends and i just think mm -hmm. this this company is just like helping you know just facilitating that and doing what they're doing um mm -hmm. i don't think this was about like associating specifically Nike with the devil. It was just more about recontextualizing wearable and contemporary fashion to speak about identity and culture. Um, mm -hmm. So in, in that case, maybe there is something to be said about the appropriation. Mm -hmm. I think the use of blood is one of the more artful things about these produced objects. Because so often in art, when we talk about sin or see human attributes or emotions they are sometimes represented as animals or represented in other ways mm. for example in durer's etching of adam and eve there is an elk ox um, and a rabbit and a cat and each of these animals represent different types of bodily fluids mm. and these different types of bodily fluids are representative of different emotions and attributes mm. and you know good values to have and bad values to have mm -hmm. the rabbit represents blood which represents the feeling of optimism or positivity especially in apparently bad or difficult situations 
That's and cool. I just think that this is like so fascinating and so important when discussing the difficulties and frustrations that people are expressing against this kind of content. Uh, and listening to some podcasts, uh, you know, people typically with religious backgrounds or have an identity associated with Christianity may feel like, um, you know, this is an example of fighting fire with fire or fighting hate by celebrating Satan. And <laughs> when we kind of take the time to learn about the very loaded and very, very complex conversation Lil Nas X is, is asking us to have, yeah. I think there is a lot of truth, a lot of transparency, um, and a lot of beauty and optimism that is a part of his rhetoric. And mm -hmm. um, I think that is actually present in these objects. Yeah. And you know what, Gianna, the more I think about it, I mean, thinking about the history of bodily fluids and blood in artwork is all, like piss Christ. Uh, yep. I was thinking about that this whole time. You yep. know, oh man. Oh, dang. We what should... a... Well, a little bit of controversy. <laughs> yeah. Oh, man, we got to have Lil Nas on talk about Piss Christ. I mean, that would be so fun. But also, I mean, thinking about the, the tradition of blood specifically within art objects and how that, in, in my with my background, kind of thinking about making the ties to feminist art and performance art right. and um, this kind of reclamation that takes place with women using menstrual mm -hmm. blood um mm -hmm. and their artwork so it's, just, it's really interesting to think about again that lineage that history that he's putting into these objects i feel like you and i are just having a totally different kind of conversation that's what than you know what's happening on twitter and i yeah. think like this yeah. is this to, this to me seems just so much more productive and fascinating than <laughs> he's you know like a scene like, sure. i don't fuck with the devil man like uh-uh like, and that's also fine. Like, like if you don't i don't want, care, like, I don't that's, care that's i guess yeah but, like but we and you don't have to but you also have to like acknowledge and like learn about the symbolism that is happening like if you are also going to critique the art of it all yes yes one thousand percent i agree yeah oh gianna that was so interesting well Lil Nas, um, you know, please just come on and talk to us about these objects and piss Christ. Bianca, that would be a fascinating conversation. Oh my gosh. Well, we've got to make this happen. We clearly have a lot more thoughts and a lot more questions about this work. Yeah. Um, yeah. It is, it's so important. It's so fascinating. And we're still continually questioning, you know, every time I listen to it, I feel like I just, I think of something different. Yeah. And um, so we're also just like, I am just so interested in the Art Pop-Tarts thoughts about this as well. Yes. Um, you know, so we'll, we'll definitely be asking some questions on our Instagram, I feel as though. Yeah, definitely. So if you're Lil Nas X, you can email us at artpoptalk at gmail.com. If you're Lil Nas X, you can follow <laughs> us <repeat>. on <laughs> Instagram, Twitter. Your, your girls we have a Facebook page. Are thirsty? <laughs> Please come on the pod. Lil Nas X, we have a uh, Facebook group you can join. I will let you in as soon as possible. I will Just give you your own Facebook group. <laughs> but <laughs> our pop tarts for Lil Nas. Our pop tarts talking about the art of bodily fluids little satanic desserts <laughs> <laughs> so as always though like gianna said for real always feel free to email us with thoughts corrections concerns musings if you will and uh, we always love to hear from you so don't be afraid to reach out all right everyone well thank you for joining us today on this discussion and we will talk to you all next tuesday Bye, everyone. Bye, Lonas. Talk to you soon. Bye. Art Pop Talks production assistant is Audrey Kaminsky. Music and sounds by Josh Turner. Photography is by Adrian Turner. And our graphic designer is Sid Hammond.